Okay. <clears throat> well, let's get to it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning and, and also for putting up with that little technical glitch there. Um, welcome to a workshop on bikeable, walkable streets. Um, really glad that you all could join us. Um, to, uh, we're we're going to get to know you all um, in just a moment, but um, just wanted to start by introducing ourselves. Um, my name is Garrett Hennigan. I'm a community organizer at the Washington Area Bicyclist Association. Um, often work with lots and lots of advocates, uh, working with advisory neighborhood commissioners just like you. So very glad to see quite a lot of faces and hope to work together uh, in the future. Um, joining me is Jeremiah. Um, do you want to jump on and say hi? How's it going, everybody? Uh, good morning. Thank you for being on the call this morning. Uh, Advocacy Director uh, here at WABA. Uh, and as Gary mentioned, uh, I'm really excited to, to start this presentation and to hopefully work with uh, a lot of you uh, in the future. Awesome. <clears throat> we also have a, a number of uh, other ANC commissioners uh, joining us, and we'll be introducing them in just a moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's get to it. Um, chat a little bit about our agenda. Um, we shared this with you uh, by by email already. Um, however, you'll also see it in the chat. And Jeremiah, uh, if you wouldn't mind just popping that back in the chat. Um, so here's our rough agenda. Uh, we will be talking sort of a, a little presentation and, and a little back and forth um, for uh, the first bit until probably about 10.45, 10.55. Um, plenty of opportunities to, to hear from you um, about your experience. Um, and then uh, really excited to, to have a, a short panel discussion with some uh, experienced ANC commissioners, get to know uh, from them sort of what their process is, what works, um, how they've supported safe streets in their neighborhood. Um, and we, we will definitely be out of here before noon. Uh, we know that <laughs> it's maybe not a beautiful, beautiful day out there, but we know you have places to go. Um, so let's get to it. You've heard it from us. Uh, let's spend a quick moment. i um, going to launch a poll um, to learn a little bit of, about you. Um, three quick questions. Uh, Jeremiah, if you're able, uh, would love you to throw that up. But three quick questions. Uh, what ward do you represent? Is this your first term as a commissioner? And how did you get around last month? Uh, so thinking back to the last month, just what are some of the ways that you got around? Getting some responses coming in. We'll give it just a few more seconds. There, we got everyone, I think. Okay, we'll go ahead and end that and share some results. There we are. So we got a good spread from around, uh, around the city. That's a couple of good cluster around Ward 1. Um, Quite a few first term folks, which is terrific. Thanks for, for putting on your thinking cap this morning and, and uh, trying to prepare for the term ahead. Um, and it looks like we have, as expected, a whole lot of people get around on foot um, or have been getting around on foot. Um, some people taking bikes, some people driving, taking taxis and bus. Uh, thanks for sharing. OK, cool. Oh, sorry meant to hit that so you all can see it. So as you're looking at that, let's get into it. So uh, just some quick sort of Zoom logistics. Uh, by now, you all are probably pros at this. Um, but uh, please do take a moment. Oh, and let's see. OK, got it. Uh, please do take a moment to to find the chat box, to find the Q&A. 
Um, as we go, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, to drop questions into that Q&A box. Uh, we will be looking there. Um, and also find that raise hand feature, um, which on Zoom is down, down at the bottom, because um, we will be using that to, uh, for, for some questions if you want to ask it um, using your own voice. Um, so uh, as as we're going along, you know, you, you all signed up for this for a reason. Um, as we start, we'd love to to hear sort of what what are you looking to get out out of today's workshop? Um, what brought you here? Uh, which hopefully lines up with what we are planning on talking about. <laughs> um, so throw those throw those thoughts down in the chat um, as you have them. Great. Okay. Please do share those thoughts on what you're trying to get out of out this morning, um, and I think we'll get uh, really jump right into it. Uh, real quick, um, if you aren't familiar with the Washington Area Bicyclist Association, we thought we should share just a little bit about what what we're about. Um, here's our our mission and vision. Uh, you know, very broadly, we're trying to make biking and walking in transit the best ways to get around, uh, or that, that's our vision. Um, and we do so with quite a lot of activities and things. Um, first and foremost, we're all about making bicycling fun. Um, we host a ton of events uh, around the region. Um, here are just a few of them. Um, try to make things family friendly and inclusive. Um, some of those, some of those big rides, the sweet ride, the 50 states ride, um, the cider ride happen uh, in the spring and, and the summer and the fall. We also do dozens of social rides uh, throughout the year. I should say we did dozens of social rides. Things have changed quite a bit in the pandemic. Um, but we we also have a lot of programs that are focused on building community. Um, so we do uh, learn to ride in city cycling classes to get people more confident riding their bikes. Um, we run a program called Women and Bicycles, which is all about supporting um, getting more women um, specifically uh, to, to get biking, you know, through amazing workshops and support clinics and, and a, a terrific online forum. Um, big focus on family biking. And, and in fact, I think next week we're doing a webinar on, on getting your kids to ride, to, to ride a bike. And, and once they can, once they can ride a bike, what, what do you do with them then? Um, what are some great places to go and ride? Um, and also uh, uh, the Trail Ranger program, which is a, a really terrific outreach and, and maintenance program, which is focused on DC's trails, um, which uh, there's a photo in the top right of the screen there. Um, coincidentally, we are hiring. So if you know anyone who's looking for a, a really uh, exciting outdoor job, um, working on, on trails as your outdoor office, um, we do have uh, some jobs, some posts available. Um, check out wabba.org slash jobs for that. Uh, also wanted to mention just we, we, we put a lot of work into some great resources for, for biking during the pandemic. Um, wabba.org slash tips um, is a great sort of one-stop shop for biking during the pandemic, for getting started, for um, tips on winter riding, on wet riding, um, and some basic bike upkeep. So definitely take a look at that. If you want to take a look at some of our events, uh, wabba.org slash fun um, is where you can find them. And I'm saying thank you all for sharing what you're trying to get out of today. Um, that's great to see. Uh, so we, we, met, we work on making biking fun, but we also work on making biking, bicycling safe, um, primarily by advocating for safe places for people to bike, to bike uh, and building those everywhere um, across the region. Um, so yeah, protected bike lane and trails are two of the really big ways, really critical ways that we do that. Um, we also work to pass laws and policies um, that making bi make bicycling safe and accessible. A big focus of the past couple of years uh, on the law side of things has been around Vision Zero and making our streets safe um, and accessible. Um, which this is a photo from a, a rally back in 2019. Um, was really quite powerful. Um, 
while we do a lot of work in DC, uh, we also do, uh, we work in Montgomery County and Prince George's, Alexandria, Arlington, and Fairfax. So very much looking at the region. Um, so that's a bit about us. Um, but today is more about you all um, and giving you sort of some of the tools uh, and, and some of the thought process around how, how you can work to make uh, streets in your neighborhoods uh, safe for walking, for biking, uh, and driving too. Um, so wanted to start by talking a bit about, um, you know, why, <laughs> why uh, are bikeable and walkable streets so important? Why are we, why are we so fixated? on those. Um, here are just a few reasons, you know, I, I think top of the list for me is, is that they prioritize people um, and support community um, and also the, the businesses that, that are in them. Um, but there are a ton of reasons why, why we might want to be focused on um, bikeable streets and walkable streets. So let's just chat through a few of them. I mean, also, they're fun. They're inclusive. You know, they're they're age friendly. Um, but uh, here are some of the other reasons. <laughs> um, you probably know that that in DC, um, the, our, our streets are simply not safe enough. Far too many people are, are getting seriously injured or dying on DC streets um, in, in crashes. Um, and the, the city has set a goal of, of trying to bring that to zero. Um, and we clearly have a very long way to go. Um, here's a map of crashes that happened between 2010 and 2014. Um, you can see that they are everywhere in every ward. Um, and that almost 50% of the, of the traffic fatalities between 2010 and, and 2014 were, were people walking or biking. Um, I think that that really helps to focus in on, you know, where the problems are um, and, and also the opportunities. Um, a little more recently, you know, those traffic fatalities are, are continuing. And, and I think it's important to recognize it's not just fatalities. It's, it's also serious life, you know, life uh, changing injuries. Um, and while we look at these numbers uh, behind them is, is personal stories, is, is personal tragedy. You know, every crash leaves a family, commu family and community reeling. Um, and even one is, is too much. So traffic safety is, is an, an urgent and daily threat, and we take that really seriously. Um, so we're, we're glad that, that there's been more focus on this um, in the past couple of years, but we still have quite a long way to go. When we talk about bikeable and walkable streets, it's, it's also about the climate. Um, you know, we, <laughs> this is a photo taken, I think this was 2019, um, flooding and, and climate changes. Uh, whether we completely, un we agree on the causes, <laughs> um, and 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 it's a, this existential crisis, right? Um, we know in DC, 21% of of carbon emissions come from transportation, and regionally and certainly in the US, it's much higher than that. Uh, transportation is the leading cause of carbon emissions. So, creating more options um, for people to uh, to get around in a sustainable way is is really important. Um, with respect to DC, that that sort of helps us frame two big goals uh, that the city has set. Um, for vision zero, that's zero traffic fatalities and serious injuries by 2024. Um, and the sustainable DC goal uh, is to, to really change the way that people get around uh, by creating other options. So 25% of trips by walking and biking, um, which is now has a, a ways to grow and down uh, to 25% of trips by car. So, uh, and that's from 43%. So we have a ways to shrink. Um, how do we do it? Uh, th there are lots and lots and lots of ways. Um, but I think the, the most important one uh, that we wanna talk about is, is complete streets. Um, now, <laughs> this picture over to the right uh, it is a, I think a pretty funny uh, sort of interpretation of the streets that we see around uh, many of our cities, you know, uh, who and and who and what users uh, you design a street for makes 
really determines what the street looks like. Um, and we know that for the past 70 years or so, we've built our roads entirely for cars, uh, which, which creates the, the situations that we're living in now. So uh, looking forward, we, we talk about complete streets, which are streets that accommodate safe and convenient access and, and mobility for all users, um, regardless how they get around. So for people walking, it's more sidewalks, it's you know safer crossings. Um, but it's not just people walking. There's, in fact, a whole range of people who get around in different ways and who have different needs. So when we look at our streets, when we look at potentially improving those streets, uh, we really do need to think of the whole range of who needs who needs access to this space uh, and what uh, what what does access mean for them or what does it look like? Um, I borrowed this slide from a recent DDoT presentation because I, I thought it expressed sort of this this range in a, a pretty nice way. Um, so specifically for biking, because we're, we're talking about bikeable streets as well. Um, there we are, waiting for the slides to catch up. Um, the, the concept of, of stress, uh, level of stress is, is really critical to understand. Um, for quite a while, we have been building, building our streets, building our bikeable streets for people who were on the highly confident end of the spectrum. Um, a, a strong few are willing to ride on a street next to fast traffic with no barrier between them. Um, but when we talk about those, those long-term goals, you know, safety goals and also sustainability goals, um, we want to be including more people, uh, getting more people out biking. Um, and to do that, we need to look at this interest, interested but concerned group. Um, these are folks who are just not as comfortable uh, riding on many of the bike facilities that we have. Um, so to get more people biking, you know, we, we need to make the experience low stress for the entire route, um, separated from, from car traffic on, on most streets and, and physically protected. Uh, I'm going to gloss over this, but there, there is some, some fantastic, uh, research looking at the, the district and trying to map out where those high stress streets are. Um, while about half of our streets are actually low stress or great for biking, um, they're not connected together because they're, they're cut off by all of these major, major roads that, that basically, you know, would prevent most people from, from biking. You look to the most stressful piece of the trip. Um, and if it's too stressful, they say, nope. Um, so that's how we make our streets you know, safer for biking, but it's not just about biking. Um, it's about people walking. It's about people walking to the bus. It's about other drivers. So I wanted to plant a few sort of key concepts uh, before we get into the very specifics um, in a moment. The, the first key concept is when we talk about safe streets, when we talk about accessible streets, uh, the speed of automobiles is critical. Um, speed kills, we, we know that, study after study shows it. Um, the faster uh, a pedestrian gets hit by a car, uh, the more likely they are to, to be seriously injured or die. Um, and unfortunately, the, it's even worse for kids or older adults. Um, so controlling speed uh, is a really critical piece of the safety equation. Um, speed contributes to over 30% of crashes, um, and it's the biggest determining factor for whether or not there's a severe injury or death. Um, so we need to slow, slow cars down. Um, to, to give you a, a sense of, of why those outcomes are so bad, here's a, a quick visual representation of, of what a driver sees at different speeds. This is sort of a cone of vision. Um, so speed makes crashes more likely in urban areas, which is where we live, um, because you know speeding drivers are less aware of their context and they need longer distances to react. Um, so in DC, uh, the default speed limit is now 20 miles per hour on, on many streets. Um, that's local streets or collector roads, as they're called. Um, basically, anywhere that the speed limit is not signed, uh, you should assume that it's 20 miles an hour. Um, and that's, that's one strategy of getting towards slower speeds. 
What we'll be talking about today for the rest of the day is that we know just changing the speed limit doesn't change driver behavior sufficiently. Um, so let's so so we're going to get into some of the physical changes that we can make um, to actually make our streets safer. I'm going to pause there for a moment and see if there are any pressing questions. Um, just going to take a look back through the thank you all for sharing what you're, what you're trying to get out of today. Um, OK, so as I said, we, we can't just change, um, put up a sign uh, and expect things to be significantly different. Um, you know, the, here, here's an example of the uh, of DDOT's Slow Streets program. Um, actually, in my neighborhood, um, these signs went up. It changed a little bit, but for the most part, the roads are designed exactly as they were. So driver behavior hasn't changed significantly. Um, but let's talk about some of those sort of other changes that we can make. Um, call it a, a toolbox for safe streets. Um, these are things that you could, could advocate for in your neighborhood or really anywhere in the city to have good impacts on making streets safer. So first up, well, this shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, <laughs> we'll have plenty of others. Um, but for bicycling on, on many, many, many streets, the best thing we can do is build protected bike lanes. Um, they can solve not just issues for, for bicycling um, by encouraging more people to bike and, and greater bike safety, but they come with a whole lot of other additional benefits um, for traffic calming. So um, th there are innumerable studies that show these are safer um, over um, traditional bike lanes or, or roads without bike lanes. Um, I think that the key is that, that they give they give everyone their own space to be in. So streets are more predictable. Drivers are over here, pedestrians are over here, and bicyclists are over here, all in their own space. Um, typically, these come by repurposing some of the road, so it can actually have a traffic calming effect. Um, and for pedestrians, they, they come with often with a nice benefit of shortening the distance that a pedestrian has to cross to get across the road. Um, so these can be really beneficial, um, not just for people biking. Uh, we also know that they're popular. Um, this is uh, some recent polling from, from uh, Data for Progress, uh, a, a local organization um, talking with, with DC voters. Um, and they found overwhelming support for uh, putting in more protected bike lanes around the city. Um, this, I love a protected bike lane. I was blown away by these numbers. Um, there is support, uh, not, not just for more protected bike lanes, but also with an understanding of some of the trade-offs, um, and which <laughs> certainly folks in your position are often talking about trade-offs. So protected bike lanes are great, right? Um, some of the, some of the other ways we can calm traffic, um, using our existing streets. Um, this animation is showing, uh, what's called a road diet, um, People say nobody likes diets, but the basic idea is uh, doing more with less space. Um, so your typical road uh, often has a, an extra lane. Um, and and the, the funny thing is, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but roads can actually carry more people with fewer driving lanes. That's because we can create things like bike lanes or in some cases, widen sidewalks. Um, in this case, this is this is going from four lanes down to three lanes. Um, traffic can actually move smoother here because there's that dedicated turn lane um, that gets turners out of traffic. Uh, there are other ways that this can play out. This is sort of a different kind of a road diet on a one-way street. Um, again, repurposing a driving lane for other uses. You can probably see how this would have a traffic calming effect uh, the road is visually narrower. Um, it's a little less comfortable to floor it uh, to get to the end of the block. We can also talk about uh, lane diets. Th these are perhaps technical terms, um, but I think the idea behind it is the most critical thing. Um, we talked about, you know, 
our roads have been built for cars, quite often um, we, we dedicated far more space to moving cars, even in a single lane than was necessary. Um, a typical urban street, uh, a car lane can be 10 feet wide. Uh, in DC, they're even narrower in some places. Uh, on a highway, you might see a 14 foot wide lane. Um, we don't really need those in an urban environment. We know that wider lanes uh, encourages more speeding. Um, and so if we can shrink the lanes, uh, first of all, we, we can discourage speeding, but we can also get more space for, for again, uh, bike lanes, wider sidewalks in some cases, uh, more streeteries, things like that. Um, so those are two sort of ways of looking at our streets. Um, let's talk about some other, other things that are a little more focused on pedestrians. Um, uh, the idea here is, you know, just trying to prime you with a, with a couple of ideas of things to be on the lookout. Um, we can, one of the best things we can do is, is remove high speed turn lanes. Um, you might call these slip lanes. Um, instead of allowing a driver to uh, continue at a high speed into a right turn where they're less likely to yield to pedestrians, less likely to even see that there's a pedestrian trying to cross, um, you can square up that turn, as you see on the far right. Um, it, it encourages that driver to take a turn much slower. Um, they decrease crashes, decrease speeding. Um, and it also creates an opportunity for, for more, uh, more public space, uh, park space or, or um, more space on the sidewalk, which can have a lot of benefits. Um, if, if you take a walk around your neighborhood and you see a slip lane, try to imagine, you know, what what could we <laughs> what would this space look like if we didn't have uh, cars cutting this corner? Another thing we can do is is throw in median pedestrian uh, median refuge islands. Um, wide streets take a long time to cross. Uh, really exposes a pedestrian to 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 driving. Um, these are typically great at unsignalized crossings. Um, so you might not have a red light stopping traffic, um, but you can cross halfway take a look in the other direction and cross the other way. Um, here's one in Adams Morgan, which uh, has a great traffic calming effect and also makes it a whole lot safer to cross that street. Um, we can also look at things like raised crosswalks. Um, these are, uh, again, not just high visibility, but actually physically require a driver to slow down, um, which encourages uh, them to yield more to people crossing the street. Um, bump outs. Oh, oh no. <laughs> well, sometimes sometimes those putting things in the middle of the street does not slow people down enough. Uh, uh, seeing that a hawk sign was, was hit this morning. Um, another thing we can do to physically narrow down a street um, to, to make it easier for pedestrians is, is bulb outs. Um, you might hear these called uh, curb extensions, bulb outs. In Arlington, they call them nubs for reasons I don't understand. Um, on the left side, you see this done in concrete. Um, basically, it gets the pedestrian further out into the road. Um, these are, you know, great at, at alongside parking parking lanes or next to bus stops. Um, you can also, you know, we don't have to necessarily wait for concrete. Um, we can do these with paint and some posts um, to to visually narrow the road, get that slower traffic, uh, while still you know, while testing out the idea. Um, so do it cheap, see how it works, and then come along later uh, and do it in concrete. Um, wow, that was a lot. Um, <laughs> so those are just uh, some of sort of ideas to put in your toolbox of as you're walking around your neighborhoods, as you're thinking about uh, some traffic safety uh, issues, as you're seeing, you know, pedestrian crossings that that aren't quite as safe as, as they should be. Um, these are some of the tools that you could be thinking about um, asking folks, uh, asking your city for. Um, Jeremiah, do you wanna chat through this one? Uh, we wanna turn it over to, to you and, and uh, maybe hear, hear some of our audience. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, so we want to hear from you. So this portion of the 
uh, presentation is called Your Turn. Uh, so we would love to hear uh, if one person has a story to tell uh, about a time you successfully got an improvement completed with DDOT. Um, so if you could uh, raise your hand, I would love to, uh, let me see if we have the option to uh, allow for you to talk. So if you're interested, I would love to hear from uh, folks in the audience. If you have a story to tell about a time you successfully got a street improvement completed with DDOT, uh, would anyone mind sharing uh, with us? So put in the chat, uh, I can unmute you if you're interested. Or raise your hand, uh, use your raise your hand function. Uh, so if you got a a street light, a you know a crosswalk, uh, or if you got something awesome in your neighborhood, oh, we got a taker. I'm gonna allow you, Amber, to talk. So, hey there, everyone. This is Amber Gove. I'm a commissioner in uh, 6A, so right near Lincoln Park. Um, I have a success, but also a lesson as well. Um, and this was a raised crosswalk near the school on a minor arterial, uh, which is Constitution Avenue. Uh, this is back in the old day process where you needed 75% of block residents signing things. We don't need that anymore, which is great. Um, but DDOT came back with the volume and speed study and said calming wasn't warranted. Um, so I asked them for the actual spreadsheet with the data collection to see what the speeds were. And they have a thing called the 85th percentile. They said, we didn't need it because cars were traveling um, using the 85th percentile rule. So that'd be good to kind of explain that for folks too. Um, but it turns out they were using 25 miles an hour instead of 15 miles an hour in the school zone. So only once I was able to dig into how they were doing the analysis and ask them for that, did they eventually change their minds and we were able to get the raised crosswalk. So um, my lesson there is don't take no for an answer the first time, ask them for their micro data and then try and work with friends and colleagues to figure out what the heck they're talking about when they're talking about 85th percentile speed and their sort of default decision-making rules. That's awesome. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. We really appreciate it. That's terrific. Um, I, I suppose follow up question: um, If you're still there, uh, have you seen results? Does does it actually slow folks down? Oh, we might have muted you. <laughs> he did. That's fine. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it's been very much appreciated. Uh, it's allowed for additional improvements to go in around the corner around the school. The new, I would say schools are, are probably an easiest win in the community to get pretty dramatic changes. There are a few people that are going to argue with schools or rec centers. And I know the new Vision Zero legislation um, allows for some more leeway around there, those areas and prioritization. Um, but yes, just the new, the traffic safety assessment process um, is a little bit easier than having to do all the signatures. And uh, we just need to keep asking for these things. If we don't ask, we won't get them. But yeah, it's shown a, it's shown a big improvement and speeds have definitely reduced uh, in the school zone. That's awesome. That's terrific. Cool. Well, let's keep on rolling. And you mentioned a few things that, that I'll be touching on in, in just a moment. Um, but I think persistence is absolutely uh, the lesson that I have learned. Um, and uh, th those are some great strategies. So thanks for sharing. Um, let's keep on rolling. Um, if you have a story that you, or if you have a question or, or, or a story that you wanna to relay, um, hold on to it. Um, we'll, we'll have more opportunities to, to jump in. Um, Admittedly, throwing a lot of information at you, uh, we will be sharing these slides, so don't feel like you, you have to capture all of it right now. Um, so we've been talking a lot about like things uh, to do. Um, you know, get a get an improved crosswalk here, uh, get a pedestrian refuge island there, get a protected bike lane there. Um, but we wanted to, to share a bit about like how DDOT actually works. Um, 
because it's a bit of a convoluted process uh, and it's good for you all both to set expectations but also to know where to put your energy um, to understand what the various steps could be. Um, very often DDOT process involves public meetings and, and uh, you know, opportunities for, for comment. Um, they, we, we love a sticky note. Uh, they love a sticky note. Um, so uh, when we talk about making changes to streets, there are sort of three different tiers um, of cost and also tiers of complexity. Um, the, the first one um, is sort of your very routine maintenance. So filling potholes, striping crosswalks. Um, th this takes sort of minimal planning. Um, maybe it's just a crew that goes out and Oh, well, there's a there's a pothole there. I have the tool to, to do it. Um, most of this is replacing things that were already there. Um, replacing signs, stuff like that. Um, it can be done quickly. It can be done relatively cheaply. Um, the, the next tier, which is kind of where we start getting into to the exciting bits, are, are on restriping and repaving. Um, there's a, there's a lot of money spent in this city on repaving our roads. Um, and when we talk about maybe changing the design of what's happening on those roads, um, this is really a, a terrific opportunity because uh, the easiest time to restripe a road is when it's completely fresh asphalt. Um, so this typically takes a, a little bit more of a planning timeline um, to, to get you know new striping plans drawn up or or sort of decide on a new way of using a space. Um, but it still can be done pretty quickly and relatively inexpensively because uh, the default is we're already spending money repaving this road. Um, so changing around the striping is actually very, very affordable. Um, the third tier, which is uh, when we talk about DDOT projects, or if you think about things that have lasted you know, for uh, a very long time. That's typically what we're talking about. These are major reconstructions of streets. These are capital projects, um, and they can last quite a while. Um, this is, of course, not counting a bunch of other sort of emergency things that have been done during the pandemic. Um, any, uh, just as a, as a side, anytime we're talking about moving curbs, um, that is almost always in that third tier of, of major reconstruction. Uh, which takes quite a lot of planning. Um, so three tiers, I, I want you to keep those in mind um, because each is sort of a different opportunity. Um, but, you know, so, so there are different kinds of projects. Where, where do these things actually come from? Um, well, it, a couple of different places, but, you know, it, it could be a, a, a major safety issue that just popped up, um, uh, per, perhaps a, a recent fatality, you know, mate, made a, a safety issue much more uh, obvious and pressing. Um, could be, hmm, toad, could be road or, or <laughs> corridor reconstruction, um, sort of an opportunity. So somebody thought, hey, let's let's think about redesigning this space. Um, could be a new idea or, or funding from the council or mayor. Think uh, the, the streetcar. That was a combination of sort of interest from the mayor and, and also federal funding way back in 2008 or so. Um, could be a campaign by advocates, or or it could be uh, DDOT staff sort of just looking at a looking at a street, saying, "Hey, we were going to repave that, um, but while we're at it, why don't we address this safety issue?" Um, so lots of different kinds of project projects coming from different sort of you know on ramps, but they're all leading into the same process. This is more or less what the process looks like. Um, we're going to start with four simple bubbles, um, and we start with with master plans or sort of very general, broad area. What what's the, what's the 25 year vision for this area? What should we do in the long term? Um, then we move into you know sort of more project specific, more corridor specific. Maybe even looking at a particular intersection. What are some of the issues at that place? Um, what are some of the solutions that we could have for that place? Um, Design is, is when you're actually like drawing up plans um, for the, you know, to get ready for construction, maybe considering different options of, of ways to solve the issue. Um, and then, of course, we actually build things. Um, every project is going to go through some kind of this pro process. 
the simpler ones will move much quicker. The simpler ones may skip steps. Um, quite often, you know, for a, a simple street redesign uh, as part of repaving, we'll start with, we'll, we'll skip the, the planning study and move straight on to design, just drawn up some plans for an intersection. Um, the more complicated ones could spend 10 years getting through this process. A little more detail. Um, don't let this chart scare you. Um, but this is just giving a little more detail of like what each of those steps might entail. Um, simpler projects, again, can skip a step. Um, but for an example, 16th Street now, ha it now has moving to construction bus lanes. That started in a master plan, uh, the Move DC plan, which said in the next 25 years, we should build a network of bus lanes around the city and transit, you know, transit streets. Um, and then someone looked at 16th Street and said, 16th Street was identified in the master plan. Let's start planning these bus lanes. First, they did a feasibility study to figure out if they could work there at all. Um, and then they went further down, realized, yes, they can work there. Let's get more detailed design. They moved over to the design phase, a couple of years there, and finally they're building them. Not everything has to take that long, um, but it is kind of the process. Um, every step of the way, there are opportunities for, for folks to, to get involved, to um, improve the plans, to better understand them. Um, but this is more or less the process. I think what I want you all to come away with is that the simpler the process, the quicker it can go. Um, so a, a very common thing we'll do is look at what was in a master plan or a livability study for your neighborhood and say, what's the low hanging fruit that would make a big difference for our neighborhood? Pick out those ideas and skip, you know, the, the planning studies and all that. Um, unfortunately, a whole lot of bikeways because of their complexity, because of they involve the whole road for, a, for a mile or so, uh, often spend a lot of time in the planning study time. Um, just as a reminder, when we talk about you know, input and improving the plans, uh, you got plenty of opportunities, but once we start construction, it's kind of too late. All right. Um, so just, just to drive that home, you know, when we talk about simplifying simpler projects, anytime we're talking about moving curbs or changing concrete, um, that's more complicated because we're often digging into the surface of the road and there are whole, all sorts of things that might, you know, get discovered then. Um, but the existing asphalt that we have is, you know, actually a great playground to think about different ways of using it. Um, just because it is the way it is doesn't mean that it has to be that way forever. Um, so changing things outside of the curbs, it can be quite expensive and, and take a long time. But inside the curbs actually is pretty flexible. Um, so we, you know, when we think about those road diets or those lane diets, um, we can make these changes pretty quickly um, if the, the sort of support and forethought and community buy-in is there. Um, so I want to encourage you all to sort of um, think about what place, what what road spaces in your neighborhood. Um, you know, could could benefit from from a little redesign um, between the curves. Um, being conscious of time, I want to keep us rolling. Um, I see a little bit of chat coming through, uh, and thanks for that. But we'll keep on rolling. Um, just as a as a you know as a reminder, <laughs> when we talk about input, um, once the street's actually being torn up, unfortunately, it's it's kind of too late to to improve that project. So it's really important to keep our ear to the ground. Um, one of the ways that you know that that you will hear about things is with um, notices of intent. Basically, any time that that the district is is planning on making a change to a street in in your single member district. Uh, they have to let you know. Um, they have to let you know what they're doing um, in a timely manner and, and also give you as a commissioner and, and as a commission the opportunity to, to sort of give feedback on that. Um, that there's, that's where that great weight comes in. Um, so notices of intent are, are, a, are a good time sort of, you know, at, at the tail end of the design process to, to, to throw in constructive ideas of, hey, you know, 
what if we what if we approach this slightly differently? Um, because of where we are on time, I'm going to skip over these, but I will share uh, the slides. Here's just a little detail on like some ways to think about evaluating a plan. Um, but we want to hear from you again. Um, so Jeremiah, I'll turn it over to you again. Awesome. So we have an activity for y'all. Give me one second, Garrett, if you can post it in the chat. Absolutely. I'll bring it up. Do, do, do. Let me bring it up myself. Uh, so we have an activity for y'all. So we want to hear from y'all. We want to hear, we have two questions uh, for everyone in the audience. Um, today. Uh, the, two, the, two, the two questions are, what is the biggest transportation or street safety issue in your community? And how do you conduct outreach to your community? Uh, so let me see, Garrett posted in the chat the activity for today. So if everyone can actually click on that link right there, the Google Docs link, and you'll have access to it. So if everyone could kind of just click on that link, and so if you answer two questions to do is click on these post-it notes and type into the uh, post-it, what is the biggest transportation or street safety issue in your community on the first slide? And then if you can take a, another moment and go to the second slide and type in the post-it note, how do you conduct outreach to your community? Uh, so we're gonna spend about five minutes on this activity. Uh, and so go to the first slide and just pick any of these post-it notes and type in there what is the biggest transportation or street safety issue in your community? And then go to the second post to note and, and type in there, type in there, how do you conduct outreach to your community? Um, so if folks can just. Sorry, apologize. Yes, have to send it to the attendees. Uh, just one moment. <laughs> Let me do that again. Thanks for that feedback. Uh, folks having difficulty accessing the link or uh, have difficulty uh, typing in the link, just, just let us know. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties, just let us know. But I see we're getting some answers here. Cool, cool. Uh, once you finish with this first slide, what is the biggest transportation or street safety issue in your community? Just uh, Go on down to the second slide and uh, type in, um, how do you conduct outreach to your community? Uh, so we're gonna wait about, about four more minutes uh, and let folks have an opportunity to uh, submit their answers. Well, you got some good answers here. It's, it's, it's some really good answers. I'm always a big fan of uh, sharing outreach strategies. I think it's, I think it's cool. Uh, someone had robocalling. That's cool. Smart idea, especially to reach seniors. I agree, big buildings are oftentimes just kind of hard to reach. I 
about two more minutes, y'all, and then we're going to come back uh, and then we're going to get ready for the panel. So I'm really excited about the panel. Uh, some of the issues we have for the biggest transportation or safety issue in your community. Some of the items we have uh, are card speeding, uh, failure to yield, broken up roads, reckless driving, not obeying traffic laws, dual turn lanes, speeding cars, excessive vehicle noise, speeding during off-peak periods, lack of bike lanes, double parking. You know, I just need to just pick all of this up and just give it to DDOT and give them an opportunity to see all these answers. These are some really good answers. Not obeying traffic laws, reckless driving. This is good, this is good. Uh, cool, six lanes of traffic. Uh, so I'm gonna go over to the second one. And then we'll probably, we're gonna move on. Uh, how do you conduct outreach to your community? Uh, some of the answers we have are next door. Okay. Uh, listserv, Twitter, Facebook, email, social media, uh, email distribution, website, ANC website. If folks don't know, uh, Aaron has one of the greatest uh, email newsletters. Uh, I've heard she has a great email newsletter, uh, but she'll tell you more about that. Uh, ANC meeting discussions, door-to-door. Uh, -to -door. Uh, I know a couple of ANC commissioners, they uh, canvas door-to-door uh, non-COVID times um, to hand out flyers and newsletters. Uh, and then a couple of more. Uh, I agree, it definitely is kind of difficult during COVID. I would love to hear from my panelists about how they get into big buildings, because that's one of the issues that I see is raised in here. Uh, getting into big buildings is a challenge. Um, social media, in-person drop-ins of businesses. Um, I, I, that's the first one I think I see for businesses. I think that's key. Uh, being able to walk into businesses and, and talk to business owners uh, is key too. And then we got flyers. And so uh, thank everybody for your answers. I really appreciate it. These are some really good uh, outreach strategies and uh, also sharing some of the, the biggest transportation safety issues in your community. So I'm going to uh, kick it back over to Garrett and I think we're going to we're going to start the panel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks so much for for that. Um, I'm going to plant uh, just a few quick thoughts uh, at, before we transition over to the panel. I want to plant four ideas in your head. Of, of things you can do uh, to sort of get started on some of these um, projects. Maybe you've already gotten started for sure. Um, but just a, a, a few tips and strategies, and, and then our panel is gonna is gonna blow you away with with their experience. Uh, so um, first off, you know, start small. Um, we 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 saw an, an incredible list of of concerns, uh, traffic safety concerns, and, and street safety concerns. Uh, but it's important for you to start small. Um, kind of get a feel for for how things work. Um, so pick a, a specific issue. You know, maybe it's a re, repairing and or repainting or improving a crosswalk uh, in your neighborhood. Um, maybe on a side street because those are a little bit easier. Um, use that as a chance to get to know how things work. Um, you know, certainly get to know the three one one system and its limits. Um, uh, and and also at, as was mentioned, you know, take a look at the the traffic safety assessment. Um, it's a it's a relatively new process. It's a little bit wonky from time to time, um, but it can also yield some pretty good results. Um, the, the key there is focus on what issues you're seeing, um, provide as much detail as possible, um, and be flexible about you know what solutions uh, might might come back. Um, so that's that's one. And, and of course, you know track things as they go and, and follow up. Idea two um, it is there are some amazing resources to find inspiration. Um, you might look around your neighborhood and not really know where to start. Um, but uh, DDOT has, has put a, DDOT and the Office of Planning have put a lot of work into to, um, plans and studies um, of the city over the years. Um, so specifically, you know, you can take a look at the Move DC plan, which is currently getting updated right now. That's a long, long range transportation planning document that looks at how we should use streets and 
what are the broad changes um, the city is trying to trying to make happen. Um, but a little more specific to your neighborhood, uh, there are livability studies. Um, here's a screen grab from um, the Rock Creek East uh, East One livability study, which is sort of north of Missouri Avenue. Um, and it, it kind of these can offer you a menu of options of things that of recommendations that a planner and, and through a community process through a lot of feedback, people decided these are the changes we need in our neighborhood. Um, sometimes these ideas are just sitting in a drawer waiting for you to discover them. Um, you, you'll also find corridor studies um, like the well, a, a number of corridor studies. So that's idea number two. You know, there's plenty of places to look for inspiration. Um, idea number three, uh, which I'm sure some of our panelists will talk about, is uh, you as an ANC and as a commissioner and as a, a full commission um, do have a, a great tool, which is resolutions. Um, the, the tips I'll give you are, are that being specific is really helpful. Um, have a clear solution in mind if you have one. Um, and also give a sense of, of what trade-offs the ANC has already considered. Um, as we discussed, you know, sometimes repurposing a driving lane or even repurposing a parking lane uh, can be helpful for getting new bike lanes or curb extensions or wider sidewalks. Um, giving DDOT a sense of like, we've thought through this and we're committed to it. Um, please spend some time on it uh, can be really helpful. And number four, <laughs> uh, as discussed, you know, be persistent. Um, and also be collaborative. So uh, never stop following up. Um, keep checking in. Try to get to know the DDOT staff that might be working on this particular issue in your neighborhood. Um, bring it to your council member. Try to get them involved. Uh, often it's it's much much more <laughs> successful to to invite them to be a collaborator than to to complain at them. Um, site visits or project walks can often be a great time to have you know more meaningful discussions about a problem. Um, and to think creatively. Um, also, if, if you don't have sort of a forum um, in, in your ANC to discuss issues and to, to workshop through them, um, you know, outside of the general ANC meeting, uh, I've seen the transportation committees are pretty, pretty successful. Um, sometimes. Um, anyway, some ideas. I have talked plenty, so uh, I'm going to have uh, Jeremiah, how about you uh, introduce our panel? Take it away. Awesome. Uh, so we have an amazing group of panelists. Uh, I, I think we've had an opportunity to work with them in some form or another uh, in, over the years. Um, so we're going to jump right into it. Uh, first panelist we have is Erin Palmer. She is a commissioner for 4B02. Uh, next, we have my friend Celine. Is ANC commission. What's the, what, you got to put your ANC on there, uh, Salim. I, I, I can't see it. Uh, <laughs> there we go. AC, AC07. Uh, see, I should know that, though. I should know that. Um, Randy Downs is a former uh, ANC commissioner uh, in Ward 2, representing uh, Great DuPont. What is it? Is it Great DuPont? I forgot what it was. What's the nickname for it? I totally forgot. <laughs> Dazzling DuPont. Dazzling DuPont. That's it. That's it. See, I, 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 great DuPont. What is that? Come on, it's dazzling DuPont. <laughs> um, and we got Monique, uh, and she's representing uh, uh, Ward Eight as well. Uh, so we're really excited to have our, our panelists on on board. We're going. I'm going to ask them four questions, and then uh, we're going to give them an opportunity to. Uh, answer any questions from the audience. And so the first question we have uh, for our panelists, tell us about a project that you were particularly proud of and tell us how it played out. So we're gonna start with, uh, we're gonna go Aaron, Celine, Randy, uh, Monique, and then we're gonna go back in the reverse. And so we're gonna start with Aaron uh, first. So tell us about a project you were particularly proud of and tell us how it played out. Okay, thank you, Jeremiah, um, and thank you, Garrett, for including me. Um, also, thank you to my fellow panelists who I know and know work very hard on these and other issues, so it's great to connect um, again in a proactive way. So I actually have two examples, one of which is bigger and one of which is smaller, and I'll try and be efficient in talking about them so I don't take up too much time. Um, the first involves... Um, the sheds at Walter Reed. 
I don't know if anybody is familiar with that, but Walter Reed is a historic district in and of itself. And on the southern portion, there are two dilapidated sheds that were built kind of later in the historic period um, and don't really serve any function. And the developer had offered to give back some of that land to improve the sidewalk on that street, which is very problematic and not ADA accessible. Um, and their seating of that land um, was proposed to allow a shared, a mixed use trail, as well as a safety buffer with trees, um, proper turning lanes for buses, and um, even additional parking. And before I came on as a commissioner, that project was like extremely controversial, um, both from the historic preservation perspective, there were a couple of people who were just dedicated to preserving those sheds. Um, and then some of the neighbors who I think more broadly were resistant to change and maybe didn't understand the full scope of the benefits. Um, but this to me coming in seemed like an amazing project. It was an improvement all around and the safety possibilities and improvements dramatically outweighed any historic preservation goals. So we had a almost full set of new commissioners. We were all in agreement. Um, we were able to recognize that the voices in opposition were a very small subset of people and that the majority of the community supported this project. So we did a resolution in support. We worked with, um, we worked with neighbors and we talked to the Walter Reed people and the city agency contacts that work on Walter Reed. Um, so it was a pretty robust resolution and I think was helpful to them. The whole project went to the mayor's agent, which is part of like a review process for historic stuff. Um, and it was approved. So that project is moving forward, um, which is very positive. Um, a kind of smaller thing is I'm working on, I have a notice of intent from DDOT for an intersection improvement at 8th Whittier and Piney Branch. And this is just kind of a micro, very problematic intersection it's just a tiny little piece of the pie. And we had neighbors who um, did a traffic safety assessment for it and 311 requests. And I worked with them and helped them write their traffic safety assessment and did a pretty extensive letter of support. Um, we also had related several traffic safety assessments for the stretch of the street of Whittier. Um, and an ANC resolution on that. And then when DDOT contacted me to talk about this, it turned out that their movement on this had nothing to do with any of that. <laughs> so I say that not in a discouraging way, but um, it is important to have your eye on the different, I think Garrett touched on this really effectively, the different pots where DDOT acts because they might be acting in one and not the other at a particular moment. And you might be able to leverage one area more than another. And I raised that example also to say that this particular micro project is probably the most engagement I've had from residents. Like my email chain on this is probably 40 different people, um, which is more than I have when working on things generally. Um, so there's just big community buy-in, which ultimately will make the DDOT NOI move more effectively um, and with community support. So it's not for nothing that like the community engagement part took place. So those are my two examples. Thank you. All right. Greetings, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, I am proud to say that I'm a dues paying member of WAVA and I'm grateful for all of the information that I was able to learn prior to this panel because it's given me some insight, especially to how uh, drivers view the road. I never thought about it from that perspective and how they see what it looks like to slow down. And with that being said, the proudest moment I think I've had as an advisory neighborhood commissioner is an issue around uh, traffic safety. Uh, thinking about this being Black History Month, uh, thinking about how the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense uh, came into existence was to have a stoplight put up at an intersection in Oakland. And so they then organized and was able to do some great amazing things and we know some of the history of that and so uh i was canvassing the community and i met a resident um that was visually impaired and so actually i, I talked to his wife um and 
the husband was visually impaired. So we put in a work order, a service request to get a blind pedestrian sign put up. And that was August, it was up by January. And so I learned that, you know, just through some of our organizing efforts, going door to door and looking at some of the history of, you know, what other folks have done before us, that for me was like a really big moment because I was able to talk to a resident and it was not necessarily an issue that impacted me, but it was very impactful for this resident because although he was uh, visually impaired, he did like to walk just around his house and go to the backyard. And that's how he would get exercise. That's how he would get some fresh air and just enjoy his neighborhood. And I didn't think of how much that meant to his personal safety and his family safety with just having a sign to try to get people to just slow down. Uh, so that was my uh, the proudest moment. Uh, another uh, moment that I'm happy to be able to do, especially during Black History Month, is to put in a service request to get MLK and Malcolm X repaved. Uh, those roads are terrible. <laughs> I feel like I'm riding down craters when I'm driving down those streets or just riding. And so we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm learning more about this process of, you know, trying to look, use legislation to make some things happen. But I think that having those roads paved, especially because there are two entry points into uh, Ward 8, um, to the other uh, communities and neighborhoods that we have, that that's really important. And now I'm, I'm learning more about what traffic safety means to the overall health of our community. I think road rage is very, very real. We've had someone um, pass in a tragic way um, at Branch in Pennsylvania, and the newspaper said it was due to some road rage. So driving on bad roads, not having the correct uh, traffic calming devices installed in our community can lead to some other issues. So if we're looking at public safety and public health holistically, I think that the roads mean a whole lot. It can mean how fast can an ambulance get to and from in some areas. And so I think those are some of my proudest moments, but I'm, I'm really happy that I saw that blind pedestrian sign up. It made my whole month, not just day. Thank you. Awesome. Um, hello, everyone. It's so great to be on an amazing panel with uh, awesome ANC commissioners from across the district. Uh, my name is Randy Downs. I'm a two-term former ANC commissioner in DuPont Circle. And I'd say the, the proudest moment or, or one of the projects that I'm most proud of um, is the roadway reconfiguration of 17th Street um, in DuPont Circle area. Um, so when I first started my first uh, my term, um, we, the ANC identified 17th Street as an opportunity to potentially um, have a road diet and add some bike lanes. And so we asked DDOT to do a study um, and they did. A few years later, they said, oh, I think we can do this. We can add some bike lanes, um, do a roadway uh, diet. Um, and so from there, we did uh, community engagement. And then just last year, uh, my fourth uh, year as the ANC commissioner, um, we were able to have the ANC support it. Um, and so moving forward, DDOT's going to be starting construction on um, 17th Street uh, reconfiguration um, this spring. And so very proud of this project, um, seeing it from start to finish. Um, and I, I, I'd say um, one of the biggest takeaways on this is making sure you get um, business buy-in. Um, that's what really pushed this project over um, the finish line. And so making sure you have a business buy-in is, is key for some of these projects. Monica. Oh, hello, everybody. I'm Monique Dio. I represent the Bellevue area in Southwest DC. That's also in Ward 8. Uh, there's a lot of projects that I've done with WABA in the last, I don't know, maybe since like 2018 or so. Um, so I have quite a bit of memories and I'm very proud of our partnership that we've had. Um, I think one of the main things that I deal with over here in Ward 8 Randy had mentioned that you want business buy-in and over here we want community buy-in. 
So one of the things that I do over here is I bring the community together in a lot of different ways. Um, not only do we have a traffic safety committee that we had with uh, WABA, but we also have walk-ins and we also occupy space and we have bike rides. Uh, one of the things, I have an annual bike ride every year with WABA. Um, we've done the tribe states. We've um, The best one that we've had so far uh, was the one that covered DC, Maryland, Virginia, where we started in Auction Cove. We went to the National Harbor, and then we also went over through the uh, Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Uh, the latest one that we just had was just purely for Ward 8. And normally when the bike rides happen, we hit the trails and things like this. But the last bike ride that I had was very informative. And even to myself, it was shocking. This was a bike ride that we had in Ward 8 streets. And when you have bike rides in the community and you get people involved, people get to see with their own eyes how the road conditions are, how we have um, illegal parking that are in bike lanes, how you're driving down streets and people are zooming around you. It was very dangerous. I'm gonna tell you the last bike ride was something else, but it just really opens up your eyes. So when you have these community events and you bring together schools and people, DDOT, WABA, um, all of these agencies together, we really get to see how people actually live and ride and thrive in our community. So that's one of the, um, the best bike rides that I had. But another thing that I want to mention was the safety um, patrol committee that WABA had assisted me with, with Turner Elementary School. Um, we were able to get a safety school program there to get kids involved with crossing the street safely. We had a hawk light installed on Alabama Avenue. And um, I just think that WABA has been a really great part when it comes to collaborating with DC uh, excuse me, DDOT, um, to get a lot of things done. And I do have to say, once again, it is a collaborative uh, thing to get people involved. And you kind of have to become friends with these people. I have people in WABA that I speak to over the phone, even casually. I know that we have the trails coming up now, and we're going to go walk those trails. I want to take a Rebel, which is a little moped, but it's also another form of transportation, um, just to check out the area and to see how it's going to be developing. So getting involved, um, doing fun things too, and getting community buy-in is a big thing, but actually getting people out of their house, um, walking and talking. You can even do it now in COVID. We just, had a, we just recently had a walk um, to just do a traffic assessment. So people do want to get outside, but just do it safely. But it is really important that people get outside and see with their own eyes how traffic assessment and safety really is a part of our lives and they really should take a, a more interest in it. Thank you. Thank you. Monique, we're going to stay with you uh, for the next question. Um, what is your approach to keeping your community informed and involved? So how do you make sure the residents in your community know what's happening? What is your strategy? To communicating with your residents? Well, you know, I, I just really feel that Ward 8 commissioners are a little bit different than a lot of commissioners um, all throughout the city. We really have to strive for communication in uh, Ward 8. Uh, we have a lot of things that um, are barriers. I mean, some of it is literacy, some of it's people who can't um, speak with people through online. Um, I try not to do flyers. I know people like to do flyers, but the only time I do flyers is if I pass them out myself and talk to people about it. Because you just pass out a flyer, no one's really going to read it. Even though I do have flyers and stores and things like that, but it really is talking to people. And I'm telling you right now, if I pass out 20 flyers versus flyering a whole community, I get a better impact with those 20 flyers that I had in my hand. Um, another thing too, I have a, a tree log of calls. So I have a senior tree log. So I call two seniors, they call other seniors. And I also do robocalling, I do texting and social media. Um, but another thing too, I live in a big apartment complex. Um, most people don't realize this, but my whole S&D is nothing but apartment complexes. I have no homeowners and people don't realize that. But uh, so I do have a tip to get into these uh, apartment complexes. Where I live at, they're all gated. They have locked doors, they have fobs. It's hard to get in. So make sure you talk to your maintenance people and talk to your property managers. See if they got a tenant association and make sure that they get your information as well. And this is how you communicate with a community that's behind gates. 
uh, behind fences, locked doors, and we have a lot of seniors in our community. Awesome. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, Randy? Yeah, um, I think first and foremost, uh, I would recommend a newsletter. Um, it's really helpful to um, have like a monthly newsletter um, to keep folks informed. Um, potentially some Google groups. Um, I had a, a Google group with business owners uh, on 17th Street. Um, and then also just um, maintain relationships with um, the building leaders um, and uh, engage with them on uh, issues around various apartments or, or condo complexes. Um, and then like Monique said, like get out in the neighborhood and talk to people. That's really, really important to, to hear um, you know, from the average person. Um, sometimes the ANC meetings, we um, hear from the same group of folks um, who are, are engaged um, and, and um, you know, oftentimes loud, but uh, we represent uh, a lot of folks in the neighborhood. And so making sure you get out there and talk to everyone, I think is really important. Awesome. Uh, yes, sir. I do a, a variety of different things. I text uh, people like directly. I do some of the automated texts, got a newsletter, print out flyers. I go knock on some doors, talk to folks. I uh, try to use uh, social media. Uh, I got on next door. So that's been a, a, a good way to uh, definitely communicate. I try to use uh, DCTV as a way to communicate as well. And of course the ANC meetings, but then just making some personal relationships with people in the community and just building that kind of camaraderie. I think uh, to what Monique said is um, being out to actually engage people. And I think that one of the best ways actually when I'm learning as an organizer to communicate is to have an issue that people care about and then they'll stay in contact with you around that issue. And then they'll try to get other people to uh, jump on board if that's an issue that they care about in the community. Uh, I have four schools in my community. So I go talk to the principals uh, in the community. And then that allows me to make contact with some of the students and the staff. And then, you know, we just go with it from there. Uh, and I think being a commissioner is similar to just like being in an organization to some degree. And, you know, you got to talk to the members of the organization, but you know, in this digital world, um, it's hard, but then we're also in a pandemic. So then it becomes even harder. But I think having that personal touch um, is, is, is something that is invaluable and you really can't put a price tag on it. And it, ultimately it's what we're here to do. Like be a really a good, neighborhood so you got to be good neighbors well, I, think, I think the panelists are amazing and have touched on the most important points um i jeremiah as you mentioned i have a newsletter um, that's one of the main ways i communicate but there are any number of other mechanisms to reach people social media and listservs and next door flyering door-to-door um, -door communications. And I would echo what I think everyone here has said, which is that it's the personal relationship part of it really matters, however you develop that. Um, and for me, some of that has been being thoughtful and responsive to constituents when they reach out to me, and also some level of proactive outreach. If I see an issue that I know will affect a specific neighbor or neighbors, I will proactively touch them about that. Um, I love what Monique said about making it fun. The community building aspect of it is so important. And in pre-COVID times, we used to do like um, family-friendly community service events at our house. And that was a great community building opportunity that just allowed me to meet and connect with neighbors such that they'd feel more comfortable approaching me about anything in the future. Um, and I guess the Final thing is that some of it is reputational. So if you're known as someone who's responsive or someone who is proactive and does good work, um, I think community members will <clears throat> be more trusting and open in contacting you about issues. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so, we, so our next question, we have a, a little bit more difficult question, I would say. Uh, so this, you know, not every not every situation is is rainbows, right? 
Um, so the next question is, how do you approach times when there's a disagreement in your neighborhood uh, on trade-offs? So for example, residents, you know, they don't want that crosswalk. They don't want that, that sign, that sign, that walk sign. You know, they don't want that, that bike lane. Um, and not just residents, businesses too. You know, if, if you have a business owner in your community who's like, I don't want that, you know, because it's going to disrupt my business. Um, what do you do to, what is your, your strategy or your approach uh, to, to working and collaborating with these individuals? And so we're going to start with you, Aaron. Okay, thank you. Well, this question has been posed in a few other places, so I've had some time to think about it. And um, at the outset, some of this comes back to having studied arbitration and mediation, is that when I approach an issue um, like that might be controversial, I try and strip away some of the terminology and talk about the underlying interests, and that's where you can find agreement. So people might not agree on a bike lane, or they might not even agree on a bus lane, which we've seen in our commission. But if you strip that away and talk about safety, um, if you talk about people's ability to get to their jobs, um, and you move away some of the terms that cause people to bristle, that can be an opportunity to have more meaningful discussions. Um, and in that way, like there's almost near universal agreement among our commissioners based on the views of our residents that we are interested in slowing cars down. Like that, it does not appear to be controversial. So, I mean, that's the root of our new Vision Zero Committee. Um, that's the reason why a lot of our traffic safety and traffic calming resolutions just go on our consent calendar. We have a lot of agreement on that. And I think that's because it's based around the concept of safety. Um, so putting that aside, the, the other part of this is that you will never have full agreement on anything. Um, so there will always be people who are oppositional to what you're trying to do. And it's our role as commissioners to listen to what they're saying, to try and digest um, whether there's some value in tweaking what's proposed or incorporating some of that feedback. Um, and then communicating back with them why it maybe doesn't make sense what they're saying or why there are competing interests and one interest may take precedence in that specific situation. Like at, on some level, I hate to say this, but we're just the punching bag. Like we take that, we digest it, we respond respectfully, but sometimes you can't accommodate what the person is asking for. Um, and I think to the extent you're respectful and to the extent you have relationships in the community, that process is easier because people know and trust you and can can come to the conclusion that, well, we didn't align here, but I know that this commissioner is looking out for the best interests of the neighborhood. So maybe maybe I can be comfortable with what the outcome is. It's all a lot of it comes down to I think a lot of the things I learned about mediation and how you talk to people and get them to be comfortable with something, even if they're not fully on board with it. Absolutely, absolutely. Salim? Yeah, absolutely agree with Aaron. Um, and I'll, I'll add that um, it's incredibly important to have, uh, to build meaningful, trusting relationships with key stakeholders, whether that's your fellow ANC commissioners, whether that's DDOT staff, community leaders, business leaders, when you have um, that shared um, respect, um, you're able to have you know, really important conversations uh, um, that we're talking about today. Um, I would also add uh, process is incredibly important. So make sure that residents um, or stakeholders um, know about and have access to a clear process, decision-making process um, and engagement. I think when you make it transparent, um, it, it's uh, more meaningful and maybe you don't agree with, with someone, but at the end of the day, um, you realize that you went through a process um, to, to make those decisions. Celine, you wanna go? Uh, yes, sir. 
So to uh, Commissioner Palmer's point, I had to prepare myself even before I got into the position. This is a book that I read, it's called Crucial Conversations. Uh, it has a, a partner called Crucial Confrontations. <laughs> and to learning about how to actually have some difficult conversations was something that I had to realize, but also realizing that I'm here to represent people and not myself. And so fixing my mind space and fixing my thought process to understand that I'm here to represent the collective vision of people uh, and, and to try to remove my ego out of it was uh, a process that took me uh, quite some time to learn. <laughs> and so now that I'm in the space, uh, I wanted a litter can in the neighborhood and some of the residents didn't want it. They said that people from the apartment complex across the street would come and throw their trash there. And so they had the one that was there removed. And I said, is this, is this what you want? Even though I wanted it and they said, yeah, this is what we want. And so I wasn't bothered by it, even though I wanted something else, but it took me fixing myself to get to that point to understand it's what the community wants and not what I wanna see. And so then when we have some issues in the community, uh, I think the best way to address a conflict is to try to prevent it from happening in the first place. So as much information as I can get residents ahead of time and get them to make uh, informed decisions and get the context of how this, like we have some development happening on St. Elizabeth's campus. And I try to get as much information as I can from the developers, from the uh, city's planning office out to the residents early so that when we do have these conversations, we've already discussed it. And so now when it's time to make a decision, um, there's less conflict because sometimes the conflicts arise because people weren't made aware of all of the details. Um, and to, uh, to Commissioner Palmer's point, we're still not always going to come to an agreement, but it's like, look, we need to make a decision. And we've had 90 days to make this decision and it's not going to get any easier. And I think once you give people the, you know, the truth and be as transparent as you can with the information as early and as often as possible, then that makes it easier. And then I say, at least at the single member district level, we have our meetings. So then when I'm going back to the overall commission level, I already have the answer from my single member district. And now it's trying to get the other commissioners, you know, to buy in to something. So, I mean, it's a process, you know, we're many Congresses, <laughs> you know, Senates at our level. And it's just the art of, you know, negotiation and persuasion at that point. Jeremiah, can you repeat the question again, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, how do you approach times when there is disagreement in your neighborhood on trade off? And so if there's like, if you support something and but your residents don't support it or a local business leader doesn't support it, what is your approach uh, to collaborating and uh, working with these individuals? Well, first of all, I have to say, I don't let these people bother me. I don't. So what I do, I do a series of three. It's always three. Find out who's the people who have the loudest mouth, who really don't want it, and actually give them a phone call. Um, a lot of times what I found out, especially in our area, especially in Ward 8, um, a lot of people have not been heard for years. They hear the same rhetoric over and over again. And um, I think I surprise a lot of people by just simply giving them a phone call. And I'm like, why don't you want this? And we talk about it. And you know, a lot of times they have really good um, reasons to why they don't want something to change, but also too, but just like hearing them out, listening to them and also giving them a different perspective. We may not come to a great understanding right there, but if something changes that they don't want or something changes that I don't want, at least we have a, a mutual understanding of why this is going. And one thing I say about Ward 8 is uh, we have to be progressive. A lot of times we have people who have been in the same positions doing the same things and we do the same thing all the time. That's insanity. So sometimes we need to change some things, but it does take a calm voice, um, someone that listens to just really hear people's voices, understand what they're saying, and then be the voice for that person. And like I said, we're not going to agree with everything, but when you know the agreement is coming, 
coming and it's not coming your way, you do at least understand. And I win some things and I lose some things, but that's just how it is. So it's really important that you just have um, good communications with your um, constituents. You're going to disagree, but you're never going to fight. And, um, you know, you just move on. Monique, we're going to keep you here for one. This is the last question, and then we're going to give folks an opportunity to ask questions. So the last question um, is, uh, how do you approach collaboration with other commissioners? And so as we know, some ANCs, they collaborate. You know, some ANCs, you know, it's a little drama. I, I hear there's a little drama every once in a while. You know, so if, if there's ever a little drama on your ANC commission, how do you work? Uh, how do you approach collaborating with uh, your fellow commissioners? Well, one thing that I'm going to have to find out really is um, how to collaborate more so with my own commission. Um, I just recently became chair of my commission AZ. And before that, we were very fragmented. So I kind of left them, I let them be. You know, um, one thing that I did, I started reaching out to other people in other areas. Um, I know a lot of ANC commissioners across the city. So whenever something that comes up in my area and I want something done, I know who I can reach out to who might be on my side and I go that way. But now because I am chair, I am trying to focus on 8D and see how we can move some things forward. So once again, the buy-in, um, being nice, you know, giving them as much information as I can, having these conversations and disagreeing with people and hearing them out. But once again, even with commissioners, it's always about someone being heard. So even if you aren't listening, act like you are. So that, you know, at least they know that they, you can talk to them and that you have an understanding and um, just make sure too that they see the benefit for them for the buy-in. So um, I really do work hard to make people come together, rather it's uh, Ward 8, Ward 7, East of the River, Ward 4, you know, we all live in DC. So we should not be strangers with each other. And I think that the ASCs should reach out to other ANCs and just create a stronger bond with all of us together so we can work on certain issues. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Randy, how did you go about collaborating with uh, some of the ANC commissioners in Ward 2? Yeah, so I think um, first with your, your own ANC commission, um, it's really important to build those relationships and trust uh, with other commissioners. Um, in DuPont Circle, we always strive for uh, un unanimous votes. Um, and so making sure that you're doing um, your due diligence in advance of meetings to make sure that you have the votes, that folks uh, understand the issues. Um, and then also, I think, you know, one of my, uh, I really, our commission was very dynamic and um, we all had our different strengths and weaknesses and leaning into those uh, strengths, um, asking for assistance when you need it, I think was really um, in, in important to um, collaboration with the commission. In terms of the citywide, um, I, I think that was, um, it's really important for big projects like 16th Street bike lanes uh, or 16th Street bus lanes or other um, big projects. And I think there's a lot of power um, that we can tap as commissioners um, working across ANCs. And so um, I, you know, I wish I would have done more of that and uh, would encourage um, other commissioners to, to really um, work with your ANC uh, commissioners across the district, um, learn from them, um, collaborate with them, um, and, uh, you know, do some good work. Liam, how, did you, how, how do you go about uh, collaborating with your fellow ANC uh, commissioners? A uh, very, 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 very good question. I'm actually in the process of trying to collaborate with Commissioner uh, Joe right now. Uh, but the issues I think are important, right? So what is mutually beneficial to all of us and being able to show people how we all can win with this. So for example, I, uh, ANC 8C collaborated ANC 8E during the Martin Luther King weekend. So we said, okay, what can we do community service wise that's socially distant, that we know people are actually looking to do something because it's MLK weekend. So we held two community cleanups, one at each of our uh, commissions and we would send volunteers to each commission each day. 
And because we have the 801 East Men's Shelter in Ward 8, there's probably residents from all of our commissions that at some point in time either had a family member there or may have been at that shelter. And so being very specific about how you can benefit from this and how this will help you, I think was the key to trying to organize people around this issue. And like I said, uh, clarity around what we're doing, uh, I think helps people a lot. And so we have a lot of people who become uh, commissioners and this is their first time being involved and engaged in uh, electoral politics, uh, in legislation. And so also trying to help people. I've asked every commissioner on my commission, what are some of your goals and how, I, how can I support you in that? And I win, they win because we're getting some of the support that we need. And so I, I would say ultimately it's finding those points of common interest and then executing, you know, following through on those things because to uh, Commissioner Diaz uh, Jolt's point is that sometimes people don't feel heard or if they've been continuously let down, you don't wanna be someone who perpetuates this idea that, oh, they're just somebody else that's just talking. And so to me, that's been one of the biggest um, things that I've been able to do, um, at least in the last year and a half of being a commissioner is just finding those common points. Um, and I think across the city, you know, we get emails from other commissioners asking us to sign on to letters of support and things of that nature. And it's like, sure, I, I, I'm down. Um, this may not be something that directly impacts my SMD or commission or ward for that matter, but if I can lend whatever support uh, that I can to something, I think that's important because at some point in time, even though I may not need you personally, the and I may move on to something else, this commission or this SMD may need you. So I'm I'm building that relationship and setting that tone for future possibilities of collaboration with the residents here. And truth be told, if it does impact somebody like in 4B02, it impacts me because we're one city. So we got to look at it and have that vision and understanding and that, like, once again, that ideological clarity over, you know, what are we here for? Aaron, how do, how do you go about collaborating with uh, your fellow Ward 4 commissioners? I live in Ward 4, so I hear a lot about what's going on sometimes uh, throughout, throughout the ward uh, with the commissioners. So. All right. Well, I'll start commission level because when we so when I first came in to two plus years ago seven of nine people were new and part of that large transition was that there was severe interpersonal conflict on the commission and it the commission was unable to really do very much at that point so there was a whole bunch of turnover I think partly driven by the community in the hopes that we would be um a collaborative commission and that's part of what i ran on and i think we've been pretty successful at that because seven of us being new that was a joint goal that we all had so as randy mentioned we come in and we like use our planning meetings as a big opportunity to hash stuff out and like deal with any issues we might have with things ideally there and not um to not be fighting at a public meeting um, we also, it's the same thing I said about talking to residents. I think we're extremely respectful to each other, even when we disagree on issues. Um, and something that I think, um, in terms of like relationship and trust building, um, I'm the secretary of the commission, and so a lot of administrative burden has fallen on me, which can be frustrating, but it also has allowed me to support my fellow commissioners, and that creates, creates a relationship of trust. So I think it has improved our ability to talk frankly and talk respectfully to each other. Um, in terms of cross-commission collaboration, I think there's just such a such an interest in it and like it's something commissioners really, really want. Like we want to be able to have the capacity to coordinate across commission lines. And that is somewhat limited by our lack of infrastructure. And I think from some of the institutional entities, the lack of a belief that we're really meant to operate that way. 
Um, so we're functionally creating that infrastructure ourselves as commissioners, and that has its own challenges since we're volunteers and we have limited capacity, but people really, really want it, which is part of why meetings like this are so helpful because it's a forum for us to talk across commissions and have a little bit of support. Um, again, some of that involves like keeping your ear to the ground and knowing who's talking about what issues and that can kind of tick in your mind what you might collaborate on. Um, and I think some of it comes down to a willingness to do the work and not necessarily be the face of that work. Um, that's part of how cross commission collaboration works is like you're kind of seeding your leadership isn't the right word, but you're seeding yourself for like a more common goal. And so some of it, this is commission level two, you're like not acting from a place of ego, it's acting from a place of wanting to actually move an issue forward and make something better for people. Um, and if you if you convey that, if that's clear in your communications and think about you, I think it really opens the door to, so much comes down to the relationship building and the trust. So that's whether you're dealing with residents or dealing with commissioners, um, and so that's an important thing to invest in, I think. Awesome. Um, so we have about 10 more minutes, y'all. I know Garrett promised you to get y'all out here before 12. Uh, but you know, we've had an awesome panel and we've had an awesome discussion. Uh, so I wanna give folks an opportunity to ask any uh, pressing questions you may have before we uh, wrap up. Uh, this morning. Does anyone have any questions for our commissioners? Uh, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and ask. Salim. Yeah, Salim, you want to, you have a question? Yes. Okay. So I'm already reaching out to Commissioner uh, Joe. I want to know what can we over here in Ward 8 collaborate with on our folks in Ward 2 and Ward 4? Uh, you know, I haven't really um, thought about that just yet because they are so, uh, th the distance is, is so great. Um, but I do believe that we have a collaboration coming up with Ward 6 that's coming up really soon with the Frederick Douglass Bridge, so you have to keep up with that. Um, I would like to do any type of collaboration, especially when we had these Vision Zero uh, meetings. It was a great time for a lot of commissioners across the city that would come together and talk about our issues. And when we're all together in the same room, we kind of find out that they're the same issues. Um, so I really don't know. We would need help to get you know collaborations from different boards in the city, especially the ones that are so far. But I'm willing to do whatever you would like to do in order to bring that about. All right. So I know our folks over in 4B and 2B got something that we can support. Um, you know, that, that leads us to an idea we were kind of throwing around. You know, Aaron mentioned the Vision Zero Committee. You know, it'd be great if we had a Vision Zero Caucus in a citywide, you know, of commissioners. Uh, you know, we're kind of like, a, that way, like we can explore and, and talk about issues like, citywide issues like Move DC, citywide issues like the Vision Zero legislation. Um, and so that's an idea we were kind of like throwing around and exploring, and we would love to reach out to some of you commissioners after this meeting and maybe look into the idea a little bit more about how do we collaborate citywide, because I think it's a great opportunity to work on citywide legislation. Uh, Alex has a question. Uh, what needs to happen after your ANC sends a resolution to DDOT? So what needs to happen after the ANC sends a resolution? Uh, Monique, you want to take this one? Oh, you know, you got your hand raised, so I didn't know. Yeah, what for was. something else. Okay. I'm gonna. Is anybody on DDOT here? I don't think we have any DDOT, but uh. Well, okay. Well, when we have resolutions for DDOT, and the thing is, working with DDOT, you got to stay on them. So if you have to use Twitter or whatever to get on them, you you just do. Um, but. You know, once you make a resolution with DDOT, um, you get your contact person. We have Joshua, he's our Ward 8 representative. You just make sure that it's gonna go where it needs to go. And I don't know, we've, we've always had really good responses when it came to our resolutions here. So once ever it's done, it's put in the right hands and you should be able to see whatever small or larger things that you have up the pipeline actually coming into fruition with DDOT. But it is a point of having some, I wish we had committees 
Uh, we have so many issues in Ward 8 and it's kind of hard for us to focus on one thing at a time because there's so many things going on. And if we had like a, a, a committee that could stay on top of these things, that would um, really help us a lot. But if you are responsible for in your SMD, make sure that you follow up, uh, you reach out, you write those emails, you are responsive and get it done. Can I answer that too, uh, please? Absolutely. So when I was working to get the sign put up, that was definitely a DDOT issue. But I also contacted the office on uh, disability rights. And once I started to bring in other agencies that had a uh, vested interest in this, then it put more pressure on uh, DDOT to have to act. Uh, but then it's also mobilizing some of the residents in the community to go to that council member that may have oversight over DDOT. And in this case, it's uh, council member Mary Che who has oversight over DDOT. So it's consistently like uh, Monique said, you know, applying pressure you know, from multiple angles. It's never going to be enough to just have a service request or to just have a resolution. It's, it can be draining. Honestly, I'm not even gonna lie to you. And it can be mentally exhausting and just frustrating, but we gotta keep hitting all of these different spots. And when we're making the relationships in the community to get people mobilized around it, then it makes the uh, burden a lot less uh, stressful because now multiple people are engaged. I, I would add, um, for our DDOT resolutions, we often send them also to the council in its oversight capacity and to our ward council member. Um, and we put them in the ANC resolution portal. So there's like a collection of them somewhere. And if it at all relates to DC council legislation, we send it to the council secretary. Um, because I had heard that they, the council secretary sends like a weekly digest of resolutions. So that is the way to ensure that the appropriate staff people at the council will see it. Um, and I can't even remember where I heard that, but once I heard it, I was like, yes, we're doing that going forward. You know, honestly, on my years of advocacy, that's the first time I've actually heard that too. <laughs> Does anyone uh does anyone have any other any other questions before we wrap up? Any questions for our panelists? Uh, wait one more second. Uh, Monique, you have a question? I just have one question because we had the Ward 8 Safety Traffic Committee for like three years, and it was um Hannah Nagel used to actually do it. And we met all the time. She brought together a lot of people, uh, safe routes to school. She brought Children's Hospital, DDOT. It was really informative. And um, when a lot of times we have these small little issues that we would talk about and actually, you know, we did a lot of things. We got stoplights put up. We changed the timing for streetlights. We did a lot of small things. And I just wonder if WABA would be willing to, you know, bring that committee back. Uh, well, you know, I will say uh, great news for Hannah. She's right now on uh, leave, maternity leave, uh, but she'll be back in March. Um, uh, currently right now, the Vision Zero grant is on hold until, so we have a grant uh, for the Vision Zero work um, that we do in the communities. And so right now it's on hold. Um, but when Hannah comes back, we definitely want to strategize around how do we still engage with, uh, with folks. Um, in the communities around Vision Zero. So she'll be back March 1st. I'm not gonna put, we're not gonna put too much on the play when, when soon as she gets back. But no, when she gets back she's at home with baby Olivia. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so once Hannah gets back, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a strategy discussion internally and uh, figure out a way we can continue. Thank you. So. Uh, does anyone have any additional questions before we wrap up? Okay, um, I'm gonna take it over to Garrett. You wanna to, you want to close us out, Garrett? I wanna thank the panelists. Thank y'all so much. Uh, this was really awesome. I really appreciate y'all. Garrett, you wanna close us out? Um, I'm seeing that Amy has her hand raised. Um, if you have a quick comment, um, go for it. 
I think, uh, yeah. Uh, Amy, I'm allowing you to talk. Uh, okay, hi, I think I'm unmuted. Um, I just, it's really just a comment, um, which is something that has frustrated us in our ANC up, uh, we're th um, 3E. Um, and that is, you know, we're strong proponents of improving the bicycle infrastructure around the city. The problem is that um, we get little pieces, dribs and drab here and there. Um, and it's and it's always so subject to the, you know, whims of, of a few blocks, for example, you know, you can get a bike lane from, you can't get a bike lane from A to C, you can get it from A to B, but not B to C, but then, and so, you know, we're seeing this with what we're trying to do on, on Western Avenue. And I, I just, I don't know how to convey to the city because, you know, we're all doing it. I mean, I think that's some of your role, but, you know, we're all pushing for these things, but like really DDOT needs to come down and say, this stretch of road from, you know, river or Wisconsin to, to Massachusetts needs bike lanes the whole way. Like you can't have it on one block and then not have it on another block. It's just banana pants. Um, so anyway, my only my only comment is, you know, I think it would be good going forward to kind of dream big and figure out how we can push DDOT for more comprehensive um, and less localized solutions. Um, and, and that's my only comment. I mean, we're not gonna solve this here, but I just, that's my frustration, that's all. So I'll go back on mute, thank you guys. Uh, agree wholeheartedly. Um, and, and I think, you know, that there are long-term plans, but that's all lines on paper. So it's all about how we turn those lines into, into reality. I'm glad to have you on board. Let's, let's fight the fight together. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for coming. I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, we did record this, so, uh, we, we're going to edit out a, a few bits and, and we will have it on hand if you want to share it with, with commissioners who, who weren't here. Um, but truly, thank you all so much. Uh, thanks to our panel for, for all your insights. Um, thanks for, for sitting through my, my blabbering. Um, enjoy the, the rest of your, your day. It looks like the sun just came out over here in Brookland. Um, thank you all so much. Have a good one.